other questions later. So uh, we're going to do more animation control. And one feature that the animator has asked for um, is the ability to specify things like blend durations or uh, time segments. Like remember, let me go to the actual file. Where is it? Um, it's in data. Animations. There. So remember we have this file and we can say like, okay, go into this state if our current animation is between these two times, right? And here's the amount of time to blend, right? So now the problem is, um, With these times, especially, uh, you may instead, well, you know, so, so you may calibrate these times for one particular animation loop, for example, but then suppose that you're going to slow down the walk cycle by 10% because that looks better. Then you would have to go into all these files and edit these absolute times because these are in seconds, or if they were in frames, you'd have to edit them that way and so on. So. Um, Really what you want to be able to do is say by what percent of the way through the animation we are. So if we're in the bottom 50%, you know, do this one. And if we're in the top 50%, do this one. So it's like, okay, well, maybe we can say time 0%, 50%, right? Um, so that's fine. But then, uh, so the reason we're putting this percent sign here is so it's not ambiguous, right? Um, otherwise, if you said one, we don't know if it's a percentage or a number. And then, so furthermore, this blend time here probably doesn't as much need to be a percent. However, it then gets confusing. Like if we don't label the things, okay. So one option that we had when deciding how to do this was to say, okay, these are always in percent. Forget the absolute times because, you know, whatever. Uh, but then this is never in percent, right? And that would just be confusing because the numbers look the same, but they're in different units. So the way that we decided that, hey, we're going to control what units things is, is just if we put a percent after it, it's a percent. And if we don't, it's a time in seconds. So I'm going to do that today. OK. Guys, please try to keep the amount of flaming down in chat. The just polite, polite discussion is a good idea. I mean, yeah. All right. So let's start doing this. Um, so the thing is now for both of these things, right? for both blend and time queries or time matching or whatever you want to call it, um, we need to be able to handle either a time in seconds or uh, a percentage. Now you might think, well, we just parse it. And if it's a percentage, then we could look at how long the animation is and convert that to seconds and then only store the time in seconds. And that would simplify the back end of the system. So we don't have to care at the low level, whether it was input as seconds or percentage. And that would be true, except remember that we hot load animations during development. And when you hot load an animation, its amount of time might change. So if this says, you know, up to 50%, we want that 50% to update every time the animation time changes. And if we, we could implement a rather complex dependency system to take care of that, and I don't want to do that. Um, so the right way to do it is uh, just to store it as percent, and then every time we engage in that query or that transition, we do the conversion. So that's going to be the approach today. Today. All right. So let's go to graph. So uh, I'm not going to worry about the part of reading the numbers out of the file in either format yet. First, I'm going to make sure we can store the numbers as percentages uh, or in seconds. So remember, we have two things. Um, we have this blend duration, right, uh, which is 
uh, either in percentage or seconds, and then we have blend duration set. Now I could here add a Boolean of, hey, is it in seconds or not? And that might not be a bad idea, except I suspect we may also want to have other units later on, like in frames or something. So if we say, hey, on frame 17, oh, you know what? Maybe we won't do that. Let's just make it be a Boolean for now. Let's, let's not over abstract if we don't have to, because it'll be easy to change. So I'll say uh, blend, blend duration is percentage. Although we're not going to store it as percentage. We're going to store it as, uh, as a number between 0 and 1. Um, Uh, we'll call it, is it a, uh, is scale factor, I, I wish I could think of a better name for that, right, but whatever, okay, and then um, we'll have condition uh, is scale factor, and then Now we will handle these things. So let's look at the blend duration, because that's a little simpler, maybe. Who uses it? All right, so if blend duration is scale factor, well, Yeah, so we want to get the primary animation and use that time. So remember when I said I wanted, when I made this get time of primary animation, for those of you who saw that, I was like, oh, this is a little hacky. I have a feeling we're going to factor this into something at least slightly more formal. Um, not much more formal, but it'll be one step. Um, so I, really what I want to say is this, fade time equals arc.blend duration times, well, Let's say primary is get primary animation. We'll just assert that that exists. And uh, primary dot duration. And I think the duration is in float 64, so we're going to cast that. Um, right, otherwise, we just do what we did before. Now, because we're going to do this elsewhere too we might it's like we almost want to factor this into some kind of more abstract time unit and call somebody to figure it out but for two cases for only two usages and for only one type of usage scale factor or not I don't think that's worth it if we started expanding into like frames and whatever else and we make the enum then we would encapsulate all of this somewhere but for now we're just going to write it out so let's go to get time of primary animation, and we'll factor that into get primary animation. Um, is it called sampled animation? I don't even know. I don't remember. I've changed the animation system a few times. Uh, so if animation player return null, um, otherwise, we just do this, return it, and if we didn't find it, we return null. So remember, we're searching backwards, that's what the less than means, along the array of channels. And the last one in the array that we see, really the first one in this iteration that's of type animation, we return. And we shouldn't be in any of this code if we didn't find that, probably. So, and then, so we're just going to say here, uh, anim is get primary animation e and if bang anim return zero false and then so there we go so now we sort of have an official thing to call when we want to know about the primary animation which is good because if we start doing blend trees that starts to get more questionable and, and we have a place to put that complexity. All right, so 
Uh, primary, we get this fade time, fade time. All right. Um, let's see if that all compiles. Not yet. Oh, because I didn't change. Right. Oh. It's not it. We want to return, because it is the channel, we want to return it.animation, I think. Current time. Oh. Oh, shoot. So, <laughs> it's like, right, so, let's return it this way. I'm gonna say get primary animation channel. So an animation itself is not a thing that's playing, it's just some data that doesn't change, right? So the channel is what says, uh, hey, um, here's what time we are in the animation, here's whether we are looping the animation or not, right? Here's the blend factor on the animation, all that stuff. So let's do that. So we're gonna return a channel instead, and let's say channel is that. So, all right. Get primary anim okay, so we're still using the old name. What? Oh, also here. So blend duration is scale factor is on the arc. It is not in our local scope. Whoops, I hit the wrong key. Okay, duration is not a member of post channel, so let's see. Oh, I have to look. Okay, animation duration. Right, so it's not called duration. It's called animation duration. That's at line 270. Okay, that compiles. Um, it's probably not gonna do anything yet. But let's, let's hope that it doesn't break. All right, so our guy's still there. He's still, you know, he's still animating in what at least looks reasonable. So we didn't break the old functionality and the reason is, you know, because even if what I just did doesn't work, it's never gonna get exercised because uh, this variable will never get set to true yet anyway, right? So everything that I'm writing is speculative and not yet exercised. Uh, but let's do that for these guys, for condition. So uh, time zero. Ah, so here's where we use time zero and time one. And uh, all right, so that's the only place. So I'm gonna say time zero is arc at time zero which will just declare things of the same type and stuff. But we say if uh, condition is scale factor, we do something. And then down here, let's not forget to remove arc off here. Uh, in fact, let's instead of calling it time zero and time one, let's call it t zero and t one, just to emphasize that it's maybe not the same as what's stored on the arc. Uh, so, if the condition is a scale factor, then um, well, this is going to be redundant, but uh, so yeah, maybe we should have a thing that returns the the, the channel. Let's call this channel. We have something that returns the channel and the time because we're doing that work of iterating over that array like twice. It doesn't matter. This is not really a time critical operation right now. Um, but I'm making a note of it. So we iterate the array twice to do exactly the same work. I mean, this array of animations is going to have like five things in it at most. So it doesn't really matter that much. 
All right, so if it's a scale factor, then uh, P0 times equals channel dot animation duration, and so does T1. It's not, oh, right, that's on the arc as well. Oh, potential loss of information. Because again, this duration is 64 bits, but these are 32 bits, so I'm just converting. And so, nothing different should happen yet. Um, slow down time. All right. So uh, the next thing to do is going to be to look in the files for that percent sign. Uh, any questions about what's happening so far? Is any of this confusing? I mean, it's probably confusing if you didn't see the previous streams. So I'm not going to super redundantly explain things that were in the previous streams. But if there are any questions that are not that kind of question, Go ahead and ask. What is the channel? So there's this thing called the animation player where Okay, let's do this. There's a thing called the animation player that mixes together the skeleton of this whole guy. So this guy is an entity, right, that's like the warrior who can push blocks. And his, he has this thing called the animation player, which figures out, you know, basically where the bones of this skeleton are on any given frame. And then that gets passed to the shader, which figures out where the vertices are and all that. Okay, so um, that was a weird discontinuity. I don't think that's new, but anyway. So that's the animation player. And then the player basically has a list of channels. And the channels get mixed together. And every channel is like one animation, where again, the animation is unchanging data and then a time factor and all that. So if you look at this display under the guy, right, in the smaller text where there'll be a green name of an animation and then some time and blend numbers, every one of those is a channel. So right now, we have one or two channels depending on what's happening. Um, and each channel, you know, it's got the animation. Oh, we had three there for a second. It's got the animation and then, uh, you know, the time on the right and the blend factor on the left. I should probably write those in different numbers. I should probably also put something on the right, like the total duration of the animation or something. Maybe we'll do that next time we expand the animation HUD. Uh, I'm not going to do off-topic questions right now. Except someone says, will the engine live detect changes to variables in the file? It already does that. We've demoed that several times in previous installments of this series, which you can find on YouTube. All right. So no other questions about this. So um, yeah, well. Let's see what happens if we just go into this file and we say here 0% to 50%. Of course, this is going to fail to parse. Uh, but that's OK. We just want to see how it fails to parse. Well, hopefully, it'll fail to parse. And hopefully, we'll get an error message. Oh, I could have I left the game running, I guess, for that. All right, so 
Error line 14, unknown command percent, which is not a particularly good error message, but at least tells you, all right, we, uh, although that's a weird one because why didn't it complain that time only got one argument? Hmm, let's see that. I want to fix that. Okay, so float A and float B. This is weird, right? So maybe our string to float isn't doing the right thing in that case. Let's just put some debug info, man. So I'm going to print string to float of success result blah Oh, I could have I could have just hot loaded the file. Didn't need to do that. String to float success true result zero. Okay, that 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 I don't like. Uh, let me see. Oh no, I couldn't hot load the file because I had to put this error message in it. Um, let me print the remainder. Like, is it? Result zero, remainder, blah, blah, blah. All right, let me. String to float. Oh, here it is. So we eat the spaces. Okay. So I basically just need to say, if we didn't find any characters, well, it's even, it's even more complex because we might start eating a character, like we might get a minus sign Let me just say, this is a little bit of a hack. Like we'll do a better string to float later. This one just scans digits and then passes it to like A to F, which is not a good way to do it because we don't want to depend on the C library. A to F is a standard like C float thing. So we'll remove this dependency later. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to say found digits. Turn. Uh, and this is still, this is not a correct, like, regular expression for a floating point number either. This is just a quick and, this whole routine is just a quick and dirty thing. So I'm not worried about correctness very much. I'm just worried about the pragmatic correctness right now of being able to handle this particular file. Uh, zero, false. Oh yeah, we got way more. Oh my. No, we broke some things. Okay, I need to put in a compiler warning for that. I declared a new, found. it's so easy to declare a new variable when you just put a colon. So I shadowed this one, yeah. Yeah, so we never found digits. All right. 
So now this is good. So string to float of this, success, false, result zero. Unable to parse the second argument to times the floating point number. That's fine. The rest of our game managed to load and run though, which means other string to floats are okay. So that's good. Um, here's what we're gonna do next. We're going to take that out and we're going to say um, let me close there's a little bit of ambient noise here let me close some things The street noise I'm not going to worry about, but I could at least cut down on washing machine noise. All right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make a routine called uh, string to percentage that basically just wraps string to float and tells us uh, is it a percentage or scale factor? And we'll look for the, yeah, okay. Um, so we're gonna say, is scale factor A, the string to scale factor, right? And then we're gonna have, uh, is scale factor B, rule, And by the time you have like four return values, you maybe think about wrapping those in something, but I don't want to right now. So now, if we have one number being a percent and the other not being a percent, maybe if the first number is zero, then it's okay to accept people being lazy because zero seconds is always gonna be 0%, but otherwise, no. So we're gonna say, uh, so if we got success, if is scale factor A, not equal is scale factor B, or let's, let's break down the cases, right? So we'll do this because we want to be able to be specific about what's going on. Okay, so if A was a scale factor and B was not, then we say uh, log print agent error at line whatever. Um, the first, the first uh, number after time is given as a percentage, but the second one is not. But we won't, we'll still, we'll still do something, I guess. We won't, we won't set success to false. We'll try to deal with it. We're just logging the error, right? So, uh, if A is not a percentage and B is, then we'll say if uh, float A is not equal to zero, then we error. So uh, the first is not given as a percentage, but the second one is. All right. So we've done that. Um, If is scale factor A, just scale both as if um, uh, okay, hold on, let's do let's do this down here. as A scales, 
uh, or just, I don't know. Sometimes my brain doesn't verbalize very well, so I'm not going to verbalize yet. So if, if A is a scale factor, we, we presume B is a scale factor also. Otherwise, otherwise we gave an error above. Uh, so arc dot condition is scale factor is true. Uh, float A times equals O dot O1. And so does float B because remember, we're given it as a percentage between, which is between you know, 0 and 100. And we want it to be between 0 and 1. So we're multiplying by 0.01. I haven't passed in handler dot line number to the error. Thank you. I do that every time. So you would think I would notice. You would think I would write the linter, but I don't. Um, error semicolon expected. Oh, I forgot the if. <laughs> I said else, not whatever. So I have to say else if. And I'm just going to be paranoid about this not. I think for readability purposes, I like to do that. Oh, and then we have to write string to scale factor. Uh, so. We're going to do string to a scale factor and lately I'm in the habit like the parentheses on the return value list is optional right now but I feel like it's good to put it all. Okay so I'm going to say uh, result success remainder is a string to float of arg. Um, so right now, parameters are read only if they're complex things. I'm not sure if that's going to uh, be that way in the final language, but it is right now, which because it allows us to pass things by reference uh, pretty easily. All right. So we say, take string to float. Uh, if no success, return result success remainder false. Otherwise, um, we say uh, if remainder dot count and remainder sub zero is equal to the following character. Then uh, advance remainder by one. Uh, we don't need to modify arg. Okay, we advance remainder by one and we return results success remainder. Well, uh, is scale factor is false and in here we'll say well actually it is true is scale factor seems plausible too many value oh who in line 470 Right, I forgot to change this to string to scale factor. All right, well, ostensibly we're done. Like, if that, if that all works, what I did, we're done. Um, I don't know if it works. Uh, let's, let's at least find out if the file parses. Uh, I don't see errors. Like, these errors we always got. And then these are runtime. So, uh, yeah, I think we at least successfully parsed the file. Um, let me, when I do this, I'm going to say print successful percentages on line whatever um, handler.line number. All right? So we want to see that. Successful percentages on line 14 and 15. Oh, let's print out, let's print out the values. Uh, 
Eso sí. Zero to point five and point five to one. So that has worked. Um, let's test. So for the blend, what is it called? Blend duration is scale factor. Oh, we never set that. We never set that. We're not done. So we have to do it here. Uh, is scale factor is string to scale factor. If this uh, and uh, float A, if is scale factor, float A is played out at one. You know what? String to scale factor should do that. Oh. Yeah. String to scale factor. True uh, result times equals o dot o one uh, percentage to number in zero one. I'm going to allow people to go over 100 percent. Well, you can go outside that interval too. Okay. Well, let's see if it seems to work. So, as we go right, left, let's try the left foot forward. Left, that didn't seem to work. Although maybe Oh, is it just backwards? Is that all that's happening? Or is my naming convention backwards? So if the right foot's forward, yeah, it looks like it's just backwards for some reason, which might just be an error in the file. Like, because the animation starts out. Right. right, left. We'll go on the next left forward. Left forward. Yeah. And then we'll go on the next right forward. Right, left, right. And it goes to state walking to active right. OK. So I'm convinced that's working. Um, so it's good. Yeah. That is good. Now let's test the blend. So uh, 
Okay, this is confusing. Because in the emails we were talking about like, oh, a blend of 90% is a good default, which is, you know, would be 0.1. Um, so this 0.09, right, is in that unit scale factor. It's like, oh, 0.09, or no, it's not. It's a second, sorry. So 0.09 seconds was a pretty good blend time. Uh, in email, he was saying, oh, blending around 90% complete. But the way that we're expressing these numbers, if we want this to be the same meaning, whether it's in seconds or percent, we really want to say 10% and not 90%, right? We want to say, oh, did, I think we still have our print in there, right? So where is it? Successful blend scale is 14 and 15.1. Let's change it to 11%, okay, 0.11. Let's change it to 99%, 0.99. All right, so let's just see, let's play around with these blend amounts. So remember the blend factor is on the left there, it's that number. Yeah. So now if I make it like 80%, then that blend should take place, not this one, but uh, once I stop, that blend should take a much longer time. You, yes. You, okay, wait, hold on. Walking. Walking. Yeah, okay, it looks messed up because we're still mostly in the walking. Like he keeps walking for a while even after he's supposed to stop and that's because the blend is so slow. Well, I think that's kind of everything that I had set out to do on this stream. Let me think about if I'm missing anything so far. Any questions about what happens? You don't update is scale factor A on factor A is equal to zero. Oh, that would be a bug. That would be a bug. Let's see. Is scale factor is scale factor A. Okay, right. Right, so that's a good point. So if B is a percent and A is not a percent, then I'm giving an error if it's not zero, but if it is zero, we're still saying it's not a percent. But B actually is a percent, they're both really a percent, and so that's gonna be a bug if someone ever decides to be lazy like this. So thank you for catching that, because that would have been a subtle bug. So I'm gonna do this, if float A is equal to zero, do something, and that's gonna be is scale factor a is equal to zero, you are allowed, oh, not double equals, single, you are allowed to be lazy and say zero to mean zero percent. All right. Well, let me take out that print. Successful blend. Type mismatch. Oh, duh, not zero. False or uh, true. What? Huh. Thank you for catching that. That would have lived in the animation system for a while. I feel like the animations themselves need some tuning, but that is not a surprise.
Someone says, would the compiler have caught it if you had typed it with a double equals? Yes, because that's not legal. So if I had said this, I think that was where it was. Oh, no, it didn't. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, it didn't. All right, well, that's something else to put in the linter, actually, then. Um, in the same way that I haven't written the thing that checks the number of print arguments, I used to have that implemented a different way, way back in the very first compiler demo, but I deprecated that functionality and haven't replaced it. Um, this would be a good thing to check for. Like you can easily write compile time user code that says check for double equals and issue a warning or whatever. And I expect that there'll be something like that that's quite extensive in the standard library. Um, now the reason uh, that I want to do that in the standard library as opposed to in compiler switches is because it's much easier for you to customize to make it the way that you want it if it's like library code. So that's going to be how that works. Um, the reason I got confused about that and said at first said that it would catch that is I was thinking of the other common mistake that happens which, which we do catch because it's illegal in the syntax and that's this one. If you say if is scale factor A is equal to true, blah, 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 right? If you do that, that is not even going to parse, right? And, and what I mean by this is people usually mean to type that double equals and they, they actually type that. Like that is actually doesn't get caught, right? It says operator equal can only be used at statement level because equal is not an expression in this language. It's just a statement. Um, so we catch this one. The compiler catches this one, but it doesn't look for this one, but that's going to be a job for library code. Does it work for the when done blend time? Oh, good point. It should. I forgot about that. Thank you. I am spacey today. So when done, recall, is for non-looping animations, you could say for how much before they're done um, that this kicks in. And it's got another string to float. In fact, I should just search for string to float to see who does this in this file. And so it's there, and then here in string to scale factor. So this is the last case. If I was being thorough and if I was at the top of my game today, I would have searched for that to see what I was missing. Um, all right, so is scale factor string to scale factor. Uh, if success, or uh, let's call this time and not seconds because it's not necessarily seconds now. Equals time arc dot outro time is scale factor equals is scale factor goof there. Uh, outro time. I totally miss that even. All right. Oh, and here's the thing. This if you don't set it, we get a hard-coded default of 0.15 seconds. Um, actually, it is better to default it to true and say, well, it's 10%, right? Because that way, um, that way the outro time will dynamically scale to whatever the length of the animation was. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe that's not better. We'll, we'll make this be the default for now, and we'll see. All right, so where do we use outro time? OK. Outro is arc.outro time if arc.outro time is scale factor. Then we do something, and then yeah. Uh, so we say. Oh, we already get the primary animation channel. There. So, 
Um, then we already get the channel animation duration. Outro uh, times equals channel the animation duration. Cast it to float. Oh, we renamed seconds and it's not called seconds anymore. Maybe someone caught that. Any more seconds? Nope. All right. Oh, dear. What did I do? This is horrible. I bet I have some error when it's the last thing on the line. I bet we have a fundamental parse error. Like I bet I did something stupid and when it's the last thing on the line, we barf. Let's see where we're crashing. Oh, arc was null. Nope. My guess was wrong. It's always good before you run the debugger to guess at what you think is wrong because it helps you build your skill about thinking about your program. Uh, okay, so we say arc.outro time. Okay, now I'm confused. Because didn't we... Oh, duh. So... Right, so the, the thing is, this is like a compound if statement with three conditions, and the third was predicated on this, and now we need to break this because we want to change the computation here. So we're going to say this stuff inside this check for arc where it belongs, and then this. Whoops, let's close that. All right, much better. Um, so really, the way to test this is to go to a multi-character thing because these use the when dones. So, the when dones, uh, like for example, the transition to inactive idle. So right now the warrior is inactive and when I switch to the wizard, he's gonna go to inactive. And let's watch the blend factor. Okay, it was pretty short. Pretty short, pretty short, pretty short, pretty short, pretty short. So let's go into here. And so when we're active, right, remember, when we're active, if we get a message to go inactive, then go to state A to I. So, uh, and that has a when done of 0.2 seconds. So we're gonna change it to 99%. It's gonna be a very short, wait, no. This is the, okay, 99% will be very long, right? Oh wait, it didn't do anything. Why didn't it work? Why didn't it work? We're gonna have to debug this. We, I don't see any parse errors for the actual file. Did I just not set it on the, do, what, oh it's, it's kind of glitching as it goes into the animation, which may have to do with, it's not doing it anymore. 
Hop, hop, hop. All right. Okay. Oh, what was that discontinuity there? So when animations end, there seems to be a discontinuity. Um, I'm going to debug that on a separate stream sometime. Um, that should not, in principle, be happening. But I may be doing something dumb there. That, I'm going to make a note. New stream. <laughs> later, because it's pretty clear that that discontinuity is my fault and is not in the source animations. But let's stick to, stick to the topic at hand, which is that regardless of that, although uh, maybe the reason that's happening is because whatever I'm doing for the blend is broken. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, so what happens when an animation disappears out of the middle? Maybe my blend function is just not good. Like you'll see here, so that whenever an animation disappears out of the middle of the list because its, it's blend is faster than anyone else's, then we get that discontinuity. So. Oh, wait, duh. The reason that's happening is because of the 99% that I put in. See, it's still blending. It's taken so damn long. Yeah, see? So it actually worked. think. Yeah. So you see, okay, what's happening? Because I set it to 99%, right. Because I set it to 99%, we're gradually blending out over the course of the whole animation. So the blend factor starts going down immediately when we go from active to inactive, right? So that it goes 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 over the course of the whole animation, which in a real animation is not really what you want to see. What you really want to see is um, What you really want, let's get back there. I'm confused about the way I'm doing blending. <laughs> but um, maybe it's just the way I'm displaying the numbers is confusing, because I remember being confused about that at the time of the stream. But basically, what you want to see, I believe, based on the way I'm showing the numbers, is for a real blend that's not set to 99%, this, uh, this active idle to inactive idle forward 01 would be at 1.0 for most of the animation, and then the blend would happen. So if we change this to 10%, then, then I, claim, I claim this is actually working, and I was just confused. So now. If I do it, uh, right, okay. Yes. So basically, 
When we get to the last 10% of the animation, which takes a while, right? So we're here, we're here, and he's folding his arms, and when his arms are almost folded, then we play the next animation, and the 1.0 starts going down, and it takes a long time, right? So, ooh, boo, there we go. Because there's a, there's a sort of a dead time at the end of the animation, right? And now we're in the inactive idle, and it takes, it takes a long time for us to kick off inactive idle. The thing that's confusing is that we're blending out of active idle also, which is a thing that we're not editing right now. So it's confusing. You gotta ignore the blend out of active idle. So we're just looking at the inactive idle forward right now, which is at one. And then when that gets very close to done, then it'll stop dropping, start dropping, and yeah. Okay, so that's working. So that's, that's the about right, the 10%. If we change it to 99% again, then it's, it's gonna be confusing because there's like, gonna be the active idle and, and the active to inactive and then the inactive playing at the same time. So yeah, see? Because we started the blend over the whole duration. Okay, so it was working just fine this whole time. I was just confused about what I was looking at. So that's good, I think we are done. Uh, Are there any questions? Oh, oh, hey, someone's been editing the animation graph and, well. I don't like command line subversion. No, postpone that. What, I must have edited it on my laptop or something. All right, let's get rid of the boost home page. Always update your code before you work on it. <laughs> like I didn't do at the start of this demo. Uh, so source, uh, the conflict was in a graph, right? So animation graph. See, I don't even know what postpone does. Like, wait, if I say commit, is it gonna, how do I get a visual, okay, edit conflicts. Oh, we added this, right, okay, because somebody, how did that not get checked in? Wait, dude, I said use, what just happened? I said, use this text block. Oh, okay, it, it doesn't, okay, right, it changes it down here. All right, you can see how often I use these tools. So, ba 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 ba. All right, next difference. Uh, that was the only one. Or, ne or, sorry, next conflict, and that was the only conflict because conflict's grayed out. So, save. Mark is resolved. Uh, let's make sure it still works. No, not there. Okay. Uh, however, I did pick their version on the animation graph. So let's change these back to percentages like just to show him, show the animator how it works. Now the question is, we'll go ahead and test our lazy bones thing here of, of having zero. Uh, yeah. 
Let's make sure that works. first glance it appears to work. Let's slow it down. Well, wait, where's my, why is my developer control not working? Why are none of my key maps working now after I updated? Did someone turn off developer? Did someone edit the developer key map? I didn't look very closely. No. Do we fail to parse the developer key map now? Oh no, okay, so what happened is, because I was taking their files on, uh, on the update, I was taking old executables as well. So I just recompiled and we've got new executable. All right. So that was walking to active right. And now we'll go walking to active left, hopefully. Yep. So that's done. I wouldn't have had as much of a check in wrinkle if I had updated before I'd started working. Are there any final questions before I go and have lunch? Oh, Sean's in the chat. Sean asked a question above. I'm looking for it. Our blend sequential bottom to top alpha blended style. So with 0.2, 1.0, it's doing a 20, 80% blend of the two. Okay, it's, it's kind of stupid. So it's a confusing display that I need to figure out how to do better. All right, so what's happening is actually, I go down the list from top to bottom, right? And there's a blend factor on every channel and I use that blend factor to interpolate toward the next animation by that factor. So it actually, as an animation's blending out, the factor goes from zero to one. But when I display it right now, I'm taking one minus that to draw it from one to zero, just to give a more intuitive, like for the, for the animator, like here's how much of that animation is being used, right? So it draws one to zero, but you can really think of that number in the upper left as the lerp factor to go from the first channel to the second channel. And then the 1.0 on the second channel, therefore, is not meaningful in any way because there's nothing to lerp to after it. It's just that, again, I'm trying to draw stuff for the animator that's not confusing, so I draw the 1.0. Um, now this, this confused me even while I was working, so maybe it's, not the right way to draw things. And maybe the way that I'm interpolating is not even a good way for all I know. And there's other things I don't do. So you'll notice sometimes we get multiple, uh, multiple of the same animation in the list. Like we go animation A, then B, then A sometimes. I don't remember how to do it, but uh, I guess maybe if I start. Anyway, you, you may have seen it happen in there. And if, so provided that I'm using, um, you know, non-spherical lerp for the orientations, then I'm pretty sure this should all be uh, transitive or whatever. And I should just be able to collapse two things that are playing, but then the blend factors are moving and maybe they're moving at different speeds. 
And so maybe I don't really want to collapse them except as an optimization, which may not be worth doing. I don't know. Uh, but that, maybe that's a good enough explanation of what's happening. Sean's other question is, are you using smooth step on the blend out? It seems like not. And I think it would be better for the C1 continuity, but I never, no, there is no smooth step in play right now. It is only um, lerp. And that's not because I think that's better. It's just because that's what I typed in to get the animation system working. Let me write that down as well. Um, I'm getting a new piece of paper. Because these can be good topics for future streams. So there's smooth step, question mark. And uh, 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 discontinuities, question mark. I'm not exactly sure. Like, given the weird interpolation that I just described, I'm pretty sure it would be obvious why there are discontinuities when an animation disappears from the middle. If I sat down and thought about it, um, right, no, it's obvious because we're interpolating toward the animation that disappeared by the factor of the previous guy. So once that guy disappears out of the middle, there's obviously a discontinuity. So the, the blending that I'm doing is wrong in that sense. Um, and I need to do a blending that's probably independent of the order of the animations. Uh, so I probably just needed to, to do add all the things and divide by n, right? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be the main and only order independent blend? Uh, and then in that case, the smooth step would go on the add factor. Right? Or not divide by n. So you compute the blend factor for each animation. You weight every position and orientation by that. You accumulate that. And then you divide by the sum of all the blend factors. Right? Um, that should be order independent and uh, smooth steppable because you can apply the smooth step to the factor instead of using the linear factor. Uh, that might be a good stream. Uh, someone is asking, SE5A1 is asking, a more general architect question, how do you prevent yourself from coding yourself into a corner? I seem to do this in all my projects. It depends on what you mean by coding yourself into a corner. Um, Here's the thing. If, if in a corner means I just don't know to, how to go, like the, the structure I ended it up with kind of sucks and I don't know how to get from here to where I want to go, that's fine. Um, the thing to do in that case is you rewrite it. You know, um, So a lot of being a good programmer <laughs> is essentially just having the muscle to power through and do it again when you didn't like what happened the first time. And that's true even, and, and that's an extreme way to put it that I just did it, but, but you know, that happens all the time in lesser ways. So, okay, I kind of solved the problem, but it's messy and I'm gonna refactor it and maybe it's a light refactor, but maybe it's a heavy refactor and I have to change a lot of things, right? Doing that is the way that you keep code sane and understandable. And so you have to, there's this mental block that early programmers have where they think, oh my God, programming is so hard that once I manage to get something working, then, um, then I finally got there and I better not change it and I better not delete anything or whatever. And it's like, no, what you really want, you, you need to build up your programming muscles past that point so that getting to the goal that you before you would have thought, oh, that's so hard, thank God I got here, is more like, okay, cool, I got here. Now what? Do I do it over? Do I take what I did and just improve it? Uh, do I call it good enough and move on to the next thing? Um, so, like, be willing to do something seven times in order to get it right. And that'll make you a really good programmer. Of course, you have to be able to do it seven times in a tractable amount of time and effort. Uh, but you build that skill by implementing things. So, um, 
I mean, basically, just have, have high standards for yourself and you'll get good. If you don't have high standards for yourself, you won't get good. I think that's the main, the main differentiator. Like, <laughs> people who hold themselves accountable get better. People who just want to feel good don't get better. So, <laughs> there's different personality types at play in this whole thing. Did you implement the free camera mode for the animator? No, uh, because we, we haven't decided if a free camera is the right thing. I mean, we do have a free camera. Let me, let me turn this off because it doesn't. We do have a free camera in this mode. Oh my god, my sensitivity is so low. What happens? I hope that's not a new button. Maybe somebody like check that in, turn down or something. Let me see. I'm going to have to. I need to check this. Just like if you're playing Player Unknown's Battlegrounds and you have to check carefully for enemies. Um, I need to check to see if this changed because somebody messed with it or if it changed because I just messed with the floating point thing or for some other reason. Um, all right, show log of this file. Nobody else changed it. Nobody else changed it. All right, I'm going to need to put that down. That's going to be a debugging stream. Debug why mouse controls got so damn slow. Oh, no, you know what it is? Never mind. They're fine. They're fine. What's happening <laughs> is my time scale is really low, and I... For the purposes of the animations here, um, I let that affect wall clock time. Oh, and for some reason now, now that I've been to editor or something, I, my developer key strokes are not working anymore. Oh, it's because in the editor, okay. In the editor, so my global variables are interacting. In the editor, if I'm in mouse look mode, we mask key input, right? See how the windows on the edge are translucent? And then I hit tab to turn them solid, and then I pay attention to normal key input. I bet when I go back here, yeah. So a uh, thing for debugging stream, editor mode interacts with uh, input in game mode and uh, animation HUD appears while in editor. So there's going to be a stream of just like small housekeeping things like that to clean up. Uh, someone's asking if they can apply these concepts in other engines or languages. Yeah, I mean I'm programming in this programming language, but the stuff that I am doing, you can do just fine. I mean, it's more annoying in C++ by a little bit, by some constant factor, but you can certainly do it, right? Um, you can do this in JavaScript. Oh, it's the, it's the audio crash. Let's, let's make sure that's what it was. Yep, cache decoder. Okay, let me put that on the list. I want to finally fix that. There's something... There's something where the og decoder eventually decides that it failed to decode, and I don't know why. I'm not sure why that happens. Someone says, it's probably too off topic, but you've been taught object-oriented programming is the default way to program. If you wanted to learn a different style of coding, where would you start? I don't know, man. Um, I, I don't have good recommendations. I mean, if people in chat could provide recommendations, that would be good. 
You know, there's, so for example, Casey on Handmade Hero programs in a very different style from that. But man, Handmade Hero at this point is like 300 episodes of getting really down into minutia of how to build a game engine, which is good if you're trying to learn how to build a game engine. But if you're not looking to tackle a problem of that complexity, and you just want some examples of how to do basic tasks, not in an object-oriented way, then that might not be that might not be the best bang for your buck stream to learn that specific thing. Maybe it would. I don't know. Uh, you could go to handmade.network maybe because people there. You can go on the forums there and ask for advice because cert this this is sort of a place that is frequented by people who don't necessarily think about things in an object-oriented way. So you could go there. Uh, I don't know about other examples. Oh, someone said in the chat, time scale affecting it. So someone caught it before I did. Um, uh, is it STB Vorbis? I don't even remember. Let me see which one I'm using. Uh, I think I'm probably using the official Vorbis library because that's what we used in the witness. Uh, but let me make sure. Uh, 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 what, what is it even called? Vorbis? No. Uh, oh, well, here we go. I've got, I've got Libog and stuff in here. Let, let me make sure I'm actually using them, though. Um, what is it even called? I mean, the mixer has, uh, I'm just going to search frog mixer async cache decoder. That's where it is. We don't, what? Oh, we are using STB Vorbis now. So I switched it over. Um, which is not to say that the problem is in STB Vorbis. It might be. Um, it's probably more likely to be my problem. Uh, maybe it's the way I'm calling STB Vorbis, I don't know. I have not investigated at all. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. It's lunchtime for me. If you missed any of this stream, it'll go up on YouTube. And I feel like, so there's at least two future animation streams. There'll be more for sure. But given, given what's here, there's at least two streams. So one is order independent blending and smooth step. Those could probably go in the same stream. And then uh, just the, just the, uh, the miscellaneous tasks. Um, I'm also going to write on that time factor uh, influences editor mouse control. So the reason, it's a little weird because I have two time factors right now. So so we have this time info that has the current time and the current real world time, real world time, right? But when I was doing this time factor, I was like, okay, wait a minute. I want this time factor to affect things in the game that are merely cosmetic, like particle systems and stuff like that, which you actually want to, well, I don't know. I mean, you sort of want three notions of time. Particle systems is a wrong example, but you want two notions of time that are gameplay time. And one of those gameplay times is like simulation time that maybe gets clamped uh, 
when the frame is too long or something like that, so the game slows down. And one of those is more like for, um, I don't know, like double click detection or something. Like if you want to know if somebody double clicked, you don't want that to slow down when the frame time slows down. Um, but then, I mean, maybe, maybe, and then you want a third time that never scales for any reason, whereas these two times would scale, you know, as you do the timer up and down. Uh, but again, double click is a bad example um, because that doesn't really need to scale. I don't know. I need to think about it. Let me put it that way. I need to think about if I really should scale this real world time up or not. And I can do the first step of that by searching through the code to see who uses it and how they use it, et cetera. So maybe there should be like current simulator time and then current... Uh, I don't know, non-simulator time or something, and then current real world time where this is really actually never scaled. And that would be used for stuff like mouse panning and whatnot. All right, good night everybody, or goodbye. <laughs> See you later.